And I'm pretty sure the Lord would think that way as well. So we're going to try to give you a working knowledge. And I know we're a church, but I want you to take your church hat off. I want you to think in terms of the most generic organization you can think of. There's all kinds of organizations, right? I want you to think of a generic organization, and we're going to talk about that in the most generic terms. And there's a reason. But let me show you what I mean. So there's companies that are private, some are public, some are nonprofit. There's associations, right? They're not really a business, but they have a focus or some sort of commonality about uh, their focus and their membership. Um, there's educational organizations like a university or a college. So all of those are organizations, right? So it's easy to talk about what their differences of all those organizations is. But what I want us to do is to focus on what the similarities of those organizations, all those organizations have. Okay, we're going to talk about two different aspects, right? So there are four basic levels of any organization. All right, remember we're talking about the most generic terms. The first of those is called the ownership. And that can be a one person, if it's a one person owned company, um, or it could be um, the shareholders, it could be the stakeholders that are sometimes called for a nonprofit. Uh, it can be a membership of whatever that organization is about. So the first level is really called the, organ the, the ownership. And what's common about all the ownership is they're just a collective of folks that all have a vested interest in the success of the organization. Does that make sense? So the ownership is just the people that have a vested interest in the success of that organization. All right, now the next level is called group leadership. And the group leadership you can see there, the board of directors, board of trustees, they're all called different things. But the group leadership, they also have a vested interest in the success of the organization. But they also have been given a responsibility for the organization, okay? That's their key distinction between the general ownership. Ownership has given this group leadership some responsibility for the organization. All right, and then the third level is called simply the single uh, person leadership. That might be the president of the company, it might be a CEO, it might be an executive director or a nonprofit. Uh, goes by a lot of names, just like different organizations go by different names. Now the single person person leadership, they're also vested in the success of the organization. They also have responsibility for the organization, like the group leaders. But the single person leadership has more responsibility for the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. And you can see there, if you're thinking about a company that has a board of directors and then you have a CEO or a president, it's pretty easy to see that. The last level, of any organization is called the organizational body. And that's simply everybody else. Whether they're staff, whether they're paid or unpaid, or whether they're volunteers, anybody else. That's just the whole rest of the organization. And you'll note that out there that typically that organizational body is organized by that single person leader above. All right? Now, I think you can probably agree that no matter what organization anybody wants to talk about, that probably describes a basic structure of the, or any organization. Would you agree with me with that? Okay, so we've given an outline of a basic structure of a basic organization. But we're interested in a successful organization. These people up here are interested in the success of their organization. So it takes more than just structure to be successful in the organization. So most organizations 
also attempt to put in place some things that will help them be successful. Now, the first one of those we can call goals. We can also call them different things. We can call them a vision, we can call them a mission. Uh, some people use the word ends. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But we can wrap all that up into a box and label it goals. So the organization is going to have some thing that they want to try to accomplish or achieve. We'll just call that the organization's goals. If they're not setting any goals, then how are they going to know whether they're successful or not? So they're going to have some goals. Now the second level or layer of the organization uh, is what I like to call just some guidelines. Okay, now these can be, some people call them boundaries, some people call them limitations. Uh, but these guidelines are just there to help them operate. Now, the most obvious is there's maybe laws, right, that provide guidelines for that organization. Um, all public companies have to abide by federal and state employment uh, guidelines, correct? Uh, we have to post little signs so all employees can read what their rights are. Uh, if your factory, OSHA, has some regulations about the clothing you wear to do your job, whether you have your hearing protection, eye protection, uh, you'd be surprised at the things I have to put on to go into some of these factories. I literally have to change clothes, wash everything I have, and put on, I mean, you wouldn't recognize it, I'm just completely covered. So uh, there are guidelines that every company or organization, some of them have very few, some of them have an enormous amount of guidelines. Um, thinking back to what we just talked about, the different parts of an organization, some guideline might be that the group leadership tells the single person leadership, well, you can't go acquire another company without our approval or you can't sell any property without our approval. Those are pretty basic guidelines in your organization. You might want to put in place. Um, the next level is called morals and ethical standards. So there's laws and regulations and things we don't want to do, but then there's things that may not be illegal to do, but we want to set a high enough standard for ourselves to make sure that we have a moral and ethics within our organization, okay? Some companies call this their code of conduct. And I guess it's been over a year now, I experienced with one of my Fortune 500 clients asked me if my company had a code of conduct. Well, we did, um, which is good. And they weren't questioning my or my company's conduct, they had just, created a new initiative within their company that all vendors that they're gonna do business with in the future must have a code of conduct and they must be willing to share it so they can just have it on file. Well, it took quite about a, an ask for me to get my company to finally share that. It was nothing really uh, that we needed to be secretive about. It was just our code of conduct was part of our employee handbook. And they didn't want to give away the whole handbook. And they had a good reason not to do that. So we had to peel that out, parse it out, give it another document to provide it to them. And they, and they were perfectly happy with that. But there's an example where one company created a guideline asking about the standards of another company. We're seeing that more and more today, depending on if companies want to have some control about morals and ethics in our society. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's different than the way the business community used to be. Okay, and last, uh, it's just called an accountability piece that most any organization that is successful is gonna have some piece of accountability within the organization. And that's simply just to make sure everybody does what they say they're going to do, or that they're supposed to do. Um, an author named Ted Hall, who wrote a book that I highly recommend called Focusing Your Church Board, uh, 
I had a copy of those from Brady Press, I forgot. Sorry about that. Uh, but he said this if it's important enough to have expectations, then it's important enough to make sure that expectations are met. Now, that's not super profound, but it pretty summarizes it pretty well, doesn't it? If you're going to have expectations, then you need to have some accountability to make sure that they are met, or you're monitoring whether or not those expectations are being met. So while we agreed before about a basic structure, we can probably agree, I hope, that this is a basic governance of the most basic organization. It's ever, ever evolving for many organizations, but we talked about a basic structure and a basic governance of an organization. So if you'll hold on to that, if you can agree with me on that, we'll come back to it in a little bit. But now let's put our church hat back on and let's talk about a church. And I'm going to hurry up and we're going to go right over talking about generic churches and we're going to talk about our church. So St. Andrew's Covenant Presbyterian Church. So we've got a structure, but I thought it might be helpful to you as it was some of the uh, elders and, and the officers. Uh, I will give you a brief history of where we were with our structure and how we got to where we are now. Okay? Think that'd be helpful? Okay. <clears throat> So long, long ago, in a galaxy far away, as they say, our church structure looked something like this. There were five categories you see up there at the top, and there were 22 committees that all fell under those five categories. <laughs> Not a bad structure. Uh, and from the point of view of the congregation, right, it probably looked all well and good. And most of the time it was. Uh, but it didn't always operate the way we wanted from the session's perspective or the staff's perception or the pastor's perspective. Depending on which one and depending on what was going on, it wasn't perfect. Uh, so the session, the long-range planning committee, which is that little block down there that says LRP, and John remembers back to him, uh, began studying just how effective the structure was and what improvements could be made. But what they discovered was that with this structure, each committee functioned okay, but they did so in a very independent manner. And so in effect, we had a series of independent silos. And it was the session's primary responsibility to manage all those silos. That got a little chaotic from time to time. And some of you may remember, if you served back then, there were long session meetings where all 22 committees had to give a report of what they'd been working on that month. Um, and that, like I said, that wasn't bad, but the biggest problem was there was no focus on any long-term goals. There was no focus on, uh, well, I'll just say those goals that we talked about that any generic organization should have if they're trying to be successful. So a task force, another task force was created to determine a better structure. And that task force replaced those five categories you saw before with five core values that the church had developed and then reorganized those committees and placed each one under one of those five values or they were placed um, under this foundational category that you see down here at the bottom. Now, while this was an improvement, because at least there was focus towards those five values, there's one thing missing in that structure. Can I see what it might be? Guess what it might be? Cross communication. Well. Yes, but that's not the Single one. leadership. Who is missing from that structure? Yeah, kind of Pastor or head of staff is missing from that structure, right? So <laughs> what is the pastor head of staff responsible for as you look at that structure? It's kind of hard to say. 
since we call them head of staff, we can assume, well, they're responsible for the staff. Do you see the staff up there? Well, they're there, but they're kind of hidden. Okay? So it's a kind of hard to say, and that means that oversight or that accountability piece can get a little blurry. All right? So that was one of the main problems with that structure. So, once again, the session created another task force to evaluate how we might need to reorganize this church structure even better. And at the same time, for the first time in the history, long history of this church, the task force was also asked to look at a governance model at the same time. And the reason for that was in 2012, the General Assembly of the Presbytery decided to delete about 200 pages from the book board. Most of all of them were in that area of governance. And the reason why they did that was because they recognized, if you know the Presbyterian Church, there are tiny little churches and there are big churches and everything in between. And so they were essentially saying they recognize now for the first time that the model of governance that this tiny little church uses is probably not going to be the same as this big church uses and all along the spectrum. So they wanted each church to be able to adopt whatever governance model they thought was best for them. So they took it out and said, you fill in the blank. And so for the first time, we as a church were asking ourselves not only find a organizational structure that we think works, find one that works with whatever governance model we're going to select as well. So here's what it looks like today. Um, we're going to talk about our model in just a second. Uh, but do you have any questions? Well, before I do that, let me ask you another question. <coughs> policy governance, which we'll talk about in a second. But let me ask you the same question that I asked you before. And I'll give you this um, PowerPoint, so uh, it's mail to you later. Let me, ask, let me ask you the same question I asked you before. Looking at this structure, what's the head of staff responsible for? Well, you're tempted, I know, to tell me all the fight boxes that are underneath the head of staff's box, right? And you would be correct. But now I expand upon that and ask you a harder question. What's the session responsible for? Looking at that structure. The gray boxes. Exactly. That's what you're tempted to tell me, that they're responsible for all the gray boxes. And you would be exactly right, but you're only partially right. The session is responsible for all of them. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. If you write anything down, write this down. Authority for a responsibility can be delegated. Authority for a responsibility can be delegated. We're going to talk about that in more detail. You don't have to understand what I mean by that yet, but I'm sure you all are very intelligent, so you've got some concept of that. Uh, but before we get into that, any questions about that structure? And this is our current structure. There may be a few changes down here at the bottom, but that's kind of in progress. Okay, like I said, you'll have this. All the new officers get a copy of that. Uh, and if it changes, we update it. Okay, so we're here to talk about policy governance. And I know you're dying to know what's the official definition of policy governance. There it is. I'll give you 10 seconds to read that. 
an organizational body. So policy governance is just a set, excuse me, a system um, to help that organization define and guide the relationships between those basic elements of the organization. So in a church setting, what that looks like is that policy governance helps in managing the relationship between the church's ownership, which is what? Congregation. The congregation. The group leadership, which is what? Session. Session. And the single person leader, who is who? Pastor. The pastor and staff. So that's all we're trying to do is to manage the relationships between those parts of the organization. Now someone said it best, I think, anyway, said the best way or one of the best ways to think of policy governance is just to think of it as a set of instructions. So how many of you have bought something, uh, took it home, plugged it in, connected it up, tried to put it together, and you never looked at the instructions? Come on. Every man in this room has done it. Maybe not you ladies because you're much smarter than we are. But we've all done it. And sometimes it works out pretty good, right? We get it all together. It looks right. And as the family's coming in to praise you for what you've accomplished, you pick up those last remaining parts and you stuff them in your pocket. <laughs> Look what Dad did. Yay, yeah, he's so smart. Handy. What a guy. But most, at least all the men in the room, have probably realized that if we had just looked at those instructions, maybe only spent a few minutes and looked at them, things might have gone a lot smoother. Right? Would you agree to that? Okay. So think of policy governance as a set of instructions. All right. A little background on policy governance. It's referred to, sometimes referred to as the model. And it was developed by a man named John Carver. And so it's often called the Carver model. Okay? And with this model, the governing board, or the session in our case, is responsible for determining those strategic goals for the church. And then the pastor head of staff, along with the staff and volunteers and teams and elders and deacons and everybody else, the whole organizational body, they're all working together to achieve those goals. Now, Carver doesn't like to use the word goals. He likes to use the word ends. And so the pastor head of staff has complete freedom to do whatever they feel necessary to achieve those goals as long as they do not exceed any limitations. Now, I want you to think about some sets of instructions you've looked at before. For me, I'm a visual learner type person. So for me, I like the ones that have pictures. Uh, and ones that I don't think are the best are the ones that show me a picture of what this is supposed to look like if I put it together right. If I do it all correct, show me a picture of what it's supposed to look like. If it's just a box of parts, I'm in trouble. Um, but if you show me a picture of what this is supposed to look like in the end, that's going to help me. And usually, in every set of instructions, there's a warning <laughs> of some type, right? Remove power before going any further, right? Warning, you could get shocked if you don't do this right, or whatever. But that warning as irritating as they are, because they take up so much room and they're bright, because they get trying to get our attention, aren't they? <coughs> the warning is really there to protect me, to help keep me safe. So I may not read it, I may not like it, but it's there to keep me safe, right? And to protect the organization that made that thing that I bought that I'm trying to put together. Okay. So you remember these four things that we talked about that. Most any organization, in order to be successful, is going to try to set these things in place. You remember that? Okay. Well, that set of goals 
And that set of guidelines and that set of moral and ethical standards and that accountability, they're sort of a set of instructions for a successful organization. And let me show you what I mean by that. In policy governance, those goals, they call that ends policy. And that's kind of a strange term, but that's what they call those goals, ends policy. And those guidelines, they call that limitations policy. Actually, they call it executive limitations policy, but most of them short it to limitations policy because it's too much of a mouthful to say otherwise. So it's the limitations policy. And those moral and ethical standards or code of conduct is called a pretty name, governance process policy. So if I told Ashley what's governance process policy, you probably couldn't tell me yet, but if you remember visually back what that looked like before I changed that, it's just the code of conduct, the moral and ethical standards, how we want to behave. You can think about it that way. And then this last accountability piece, unfortunately, policy governance has an even bigger name for that. It's called management delegation policy, okay? And again, it's just there to hold everyone accountable. So now you know why there are these four different and distinct parts to policy governance. And then each part is just called a policy. Hence, why the model is called policy governance. You govern by a set of policies, a set of instructions that are really a set of policies, and that's how you govern, by your policies. So you already know more about policy governance than almost anybody in the church. Congratulations, you did great. Um, all right, so let me expand a little bit on each one of those. I'll try to go fairly quick. Um, ends policy are just those strategic goals like we talked about or achievements that each organization or church wants to reach. And as I said, that word end is somewhat new and foreign to some people. Uh, and to those folks, I just want to point out that in the Book of Order, right there in the front, on page five, is something called the six great ends of the church. Did you know they were in The six what? The six, six after five, the six great ends of the church. And I highly recommend that you go find those puppies and you read them. And I will guarantee you they will be inspiring. Because they were very, they are very inspiring to me. And even though they call them the great six great ends of the church, they're a hundred years old. They've been in that book of order for a hundred years. There's nothing new about that term ends. It's been around a long time in our church. And those six great ends are incredible. But no one church is going to be able to achieve them because they're big and broad. They are huge. So each church needs to form their own ends and whatever they may be that they think they can accomplish and achieve, but whatever they may be, they, in my opinion, they need to dovetail underneath those larger, full, great six ends of the Presbyterian Church. And I forgot to print it out, but I was going to bring you a copy of our latest ends policy, but I'll get that for you. And when you do that, you'll see in that ends policy, there's at least one policy, one end that's pointing up at one of those great six ends. And the task force that worked on that was intentional about that. They wanted you to see that we were trying to support 
those six great hands, at least in one way, at this church. And I think that's very powerful. So if you do anything, go find those six great hands and read them. I think you'll find, I think you'll be proud of your Presbyterian when you read those. And to think that they were written a hundred years ago is really shocking. Because they don't speak to today's society loud and clear. Okay. Executive limitations policy. This is simply the limitations we provide the pastor and the staff, and it gives them the guidelines for what is out of bounds. <clears throat> the idea here is we want to give the pastor head of staff freedom. We don't want them to have to run to the session every time they want to make a decision for every little thing. You have freedom to make those decisions. But we got to protect the church, so here's the Boundaries. Just as long as you don't go outside those boundaries, we're okay. One boundary is the budget. Inside the budget, you can do whatever you want, however you need to organize it. But don't go outside the budget. There's little things like the pastor can't issue a payment greater than a certain dollar amount. If it's greater than that amount, you got to go to the session and get approval. Okay? All of those are just to protect the organization, our church. Now, some people don't really like limitations policy because it's always written in negative language. Thou shall not do this. You will not write a check greater than $10,000. And you will not do this, and you won't do that. That's intentional. And for those that aren't comfortable with that, I fully understand it. But let me point out that it has a biblical support. Let me read for you from Genesis. First book, chapter 2, second chapter, verses 15 through 17. I know this will be familiar to you. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of him. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly God. That's pretty strong language too. It's pretty negative. But you can see God was trying to protect his man. And he said, you've got all this freedom, but here's your boundary. Here's your limitation. Do not. Thou shalt not do this. Do not eat from that tree. Now we know what happened. Right? But we're still here in a church talking about things. Our church. So it worked out okay. There was a violation of that limitation. But the church is still here by the grace of God, right? Okay, so biblical support for uh, limitations policy. <laughs> now let's go to that next one, governance process policy. That's some pretty language. And it simply outlines how the session intends to govern themselves. So, so far we're talking about how the, we got to govern or limit to put limits around the pastor head of staff and what they may do. Policy governance also says, okay, session, group leadership, part of the organization, you've got some rules too, okay? So, for instance, the Book of Order says the pastor head of staff is the moderator of the session. Our policy governance model confirms that. The Book of Order says we will have a clerk Policy governance model affirms that. The uh, governance process model also says how our committees within the session are organized and what their individual responsibilities are. Those gray boxes you saw up there. Okay? And it even has some language about how we conduct ourselves as a session. For example, it's our ethics, so to speak. We speak with one voice. What the, I shouldn't say we, the session speaks with one voice. And what I like best is we meddle, excuse me, we manage without meddling. We manage without meddling. That's a good one. Um, we never direct staff because that's his job. I understand. That's your head of staff. If you're going to call them head of staff, that's their job. You don't want to call the head of staff. That's different. But that does not mean that 
The session cannot communicate with staff. In fact, they should communicate with staff as often as they need to. You just need to be careful not to direct staff. But that does not mean that the session or a member of session cannot assist staff if and when they are asked to do so. That's a clear distinction that the session had trouble with and had to learn how to navigate that a little bit. But let me give you a, a good example of what I mean by that. An elder should never tell a member of staff how to stuff a little more. But if a staff member said, hey, I need some help stuffing envelopes, who can help? The elder should raise their hand, they should volunteer, they should do that. And this was kind of personal for me because there was, within the last term I was on, a time where we needed a communication to go out to all the members of the congregation. And we wanted that to go out of email, but we also knew there were others that needed a hard copy. That's 400 envelopes, by the way. And somebody needed to stuff them, and they needed to happen within a couple of days because we wanted, it was time sensitive. So I and several other uh, officers decided to volunteer to do that. I've never stuffed envelopes before, not that many anyway. Uh, so that one's kind of dear to me, and I think it's a very good example. I know no one would ever tell a staff member how to stuff an envelope, but the point is not the envelopes. It's don't tell them how to do their job. That's not the session's job, to tell a staff member how to do their job, or that they're doing it wrong and they should be doing it this way. Whose job is that? <coughs> if you're going to call them the head of staff, this is pastor head of staff, to have that communication. Do you have a question? How, how should that work? Should the people that need the envelopes stuff uh, ask the pastor to get involved, or can you go directly to staff? Great question. I think I said um, the session cannot and should not ever direct staff. But the staff can ask for assistance from the session anytime. That's the trigger when the session can, can come in and start to communicate and help with whatever help needs to be done. If a, a staff member says, I don't really know how to do this. Right? Well, they could go to the pastor and the staff, but maybe they know there's an elder that's an expert at that. Maybe they know an elder who is an accountant and probably has some professional knowledge in that area if it's an accounting question. So if they ask the treasurer or they ask the uh, person that they know happens to be an accountant, then sure, they can help, they can advise any way they think. But who, who wanted the 400 envelopes to go out? Was it the pastor or was it the session? Session. At that time, the session wanted it, but we couldn't say, staff, we need 400 envelopes to go out tomorrow. They were already busy. This was a new thing. It wasn't worked into their work schedule. We wanted it done immediately. So it was way too much of an ask. It was a direction by the session to direct staff to stop what you're doing and stuff my envelopes. It was important. But because in the old days, that's probably what would have happened. And they probably would have done it. But that's wrong. So the elders went to the staff members and said, how can we get this done by tomorrow? You tell us how it works best for you. They said, well, if you give me three, four, five people to come stuff them, we'll get it done. You just stuff them, we'll throw, run them through the meter. So working together is how it got done. Three questions, I thank you. All right, so the last policy is the management delegation policy. And this one's really pretty simple. It just describes that how that authority is delegated, as well as how we monitor oversight or accountability piece that we talked about. And you recall that accountability piece was missing in that structure before we kept to this model. And let me say. I want to spend a little time talking about that statement I asked you right now about how authority 
for responsibility can be delegated. Okay? How are we on time? <coughs> Pardon? We're good. We don't have a lot there. Now, as I said, I'm a visual learner. And so I worked on this because this concept of delegating authority for responsibility as the head of the training committee, and it was my job and my committee's job to train officers on all this stuff. I could see that this concept of delegating authority for responsibility was, uh, it was a little fuzzy for some, okay? So I spent a lot of time putting together on hopefully helping people understand the concept better. And because I'm a visual learner, I, I used this PowerPoint slide to help. So I hope it'd be helpful to you to actually see what we're gonna talk about, okay? So we're gonna start with the session. We all know what that is, right? And a session has some responsibilities, right? We said that before, we have a lot of them. In fact, they have at least 20 that I can name, not off the top of my head. But do you know where they get them? You know where they get those responsibilities? Well, most of them come from that, the Book of Order. And in that governance section, it says that the session is responsible for about 20 things. And that's not all of them, but that says, it mentions about 20. And it even categorizes them. And while we're not going to go through all 20, feel better, we're going to talk about one. We're going to talk about one that we all are very familiar with. And perhaps it might not be a bad idea when you do call a pastor and when they arrive and they're get settled, probably be a good idea in my opinion, and I'm willing to help in the effort, for the session and that new pastor that you guys call, take a little retreat, take a little workshop Saturday or something, and let's go through all 20 of those responsibilities. Now let's make sure we understand how that responsibility is going to be handled. Wouldn't it be a great exercise, I think. It also would just put everything out in the open. So the session has all these responsibilities and it gets them from the book of order, but we're only going to talk about one. So that we can talk about how authority for responsibilities can be delegated and how accountability is the most important piece to make sure everything works the way we want it to. Alright, so the Book of Order gives a responsibility to the session for worship. You with me? We all okay with that? Alright, so how in the history of this church, and when I say historic history or historically, I mean more than five years ago. How has a session typically handled that responsibility? And I don't mean, did they do a good job or a bad job? I mean, how did they go about dealing with that responsibility? What did they do? Delegated it to the worship committee and the head of staff. Partially correct. They delegated the authority to worship to a worship committee. So, we have a worship committee, and the worship committee now has the authority to handle all things worship, right? Does that mean that the session is no longer responsible for worship? No. They haven't given up their responsibility. They haven't relinquished that responsibility. They haven't abdicated, and that's all the three words I know. <laughs> they haven't abdicated that responsibility, but they've delegated some authority for some other entity to take care of all the things around worship. So now the worship community 
can plan, can coordinate, they can decide whether we have flowers in the narthex and which type. They can determine how many ushers are going to be needed, who's going to read the scripture, who's going to uh, say a prayer, right? All those things and even more that I'm probably not aware of. I did learn that there's a person whose responsibility is to make sure there's a glass of water at the pulpit. Did you know that? That's impressive to me, anyway. So, to make sure little things like that that are important, because somewhere in our history, a pastor said, I'm going to pass some water right there before <laughs> when I get up there. Uh, and as we sit our water right now, we can understand and appreciate that. Now, the key part, as I said, when you see that yellow arrow, that means authority has been delegated. That only works if you've got a green arrow of accountability. So how does the session, how, or how did they hold that worship community accountable back to them? How'd they do that? Come on, you know. Minutes. They said, you take minutes and you send those up to the session for their monthly session meeting. So if you meet every month, we want to see the minutes for that by the next session, the next session meeting. So you got to have some accountability. At least you know what they talked about, what they're planning, what they're thinking about. What if that worship committee decides, hey, let's have an Easter sunrise service? Great idea, right? Can they do that? No. They can plan it. They can organize it. They can coordinate it. They can't make that decision on their own. You know why? Because the Book of Order, when it gave that responsibility to the session, it specifically said you are responsible for time and place. So the Book of Order assumes that our congregation wants to worship God. So you've got to provide a time and a place for them to do that. So if the worship committee wants to do a Easter sunrise service down at the beach, they're asking to change the time and the place. So they have to come back to session to get it approved. And I'm sure it would be. It's a wonderful idea, right? But they do have to come back to the session for approval. So the session hasn't relinquished their responsibility. They still have that responsibility. But they delegated the authority to do all those things that need to get done. But the session doesn't need to be the ones making those decisions. Let people more qualified, more passionate, make those and more equipped to make those decisions. Now, who's missing? We asked this question before. Who's missing up there? The head of staff. The pastor head of staff is missing. Does the pastor head of staff have anything to do with worship? Sure they do. They probably have more to do with worship than almost, almost anybody. Okay? So do we want the pastor and head of staff to attend those worship committee meetings? You don't think we should? They should? I think most of us want to at least know that they know what they're talking about because worship is pretty important to this person. In fact, the Book of Order gives the pastor and head of staff some responsibilities associated with worship as well. There's two of them. Since the pastor has a responsibility for the word and the sacraments. The word means they're the one doing the preaching, primarily. And the sacraments mean they're going to do the baptism or communion. So the pastor head of staff has some responsibilities for worship, just like the session does. And they are specific responsibilities the session can't do, or normally doesn't. So the pastor head of staff needs to be involved in this group down here because they are interested in the quality of our worship. There was something about the Holy Cow uh, survey about quality of worship and how important that is to many of our members. So the pastor head of staff influences these people, doesn't he? I apologize if I say he. Uh, 
The pastor had a staff influences that worship committee, and we want them to do that. We want them to be part of their decision making. We want them to be collaborating, right? Now, there's one other thing that the pastor head of staff does related to worship, instructed by the Book of Order. And that is, the pastor is supposed to coordinate with the music director about selecting the music, the hymns. If you look in the hymnal, it's organized by themes. That helps the pastor figure out. If I'm going to talk about the resurrection, he can go look in, he or she can go look in there and pick out some hymns about resurrection or ascension or whatever the topic is. Makes it easier for him. That's why it's organized that way. But they're supposed to coordinate with the music director, ministry of music, whatever you call them, right? They don't necessarily say that the children are singing. The worship committee might be talking about that. Let's have the children sing this Sunday versus the choir, or let's have them together. They do all those things. They talk about that and coordinate that. But the pastor needs to work and is expected to work with the music minister or director about selecting of the music for worship. So if you choose this governance model, the pastor's over there as a dotted line. It, it can't be helped. So does the music minister report to the pastor and staff, or do they report up to the session? That was one of the questions yeah. I was trying to figure out. Kind of hard to figure out. Yeah. Sometimes it depends on the personality. Yeah. If that's not really right, it shouldn't be that way. That can all work beautifully for a hundred years. As soon as the wrong person with the wrong personality is in that, all of a sudden, blurry lines of authority, blurry lines of communication. Um, and that's the problem with that particular governance model. Um, we're just talking about one responsibility. There's at least 19 more. And this is just one. So what if we did it a different way? What if instead of delegating the authority for the responsibility of worship to a worship committee, the session delegates that to the pastor head of staff? Now, can the pastor head of staff coordinate all things worship by themselves? Probably not. Not after a while, they're going to get burned out real quick. So if they're smart, they'll further delegate the authority for the responsibility of worship to a worship team. And we only use the word team to distinguish that it is not a committee reporting back to session. It's a team reporting back to the pastor head of staff, to which he may ask them to send him minutes. But he's more than likely in the meeting anyway. So he might not ask them to do minutes, right? But then the pastor head of staff is accountable back to the session. Now a little blurry line. So to your question, who does the music director or minister report to? Pastor head of staff. And through that pastor head of staff, the session does not relinquish their responsibility. If they want to check, go do that Easter sunrise service, they got to get his approval. And he says, I'll take it to session in the form of a motion to see if I can get the session to approve. Still a great idea. More than likely it'll get approved. But now it's a clear line of accountability. Um, now, one of the key things about this is that worship team, the makeup of that worship team can be exactly the same people that work on that worship community. It probably should mirror it in every step, step of the way, every single way. It's not, shouldn't be smaller, 
they still got the same responsibility. So if it takes 20 people to make a worship committee, it probably takes 20 to make a worship team. Now the chair doesn't have to be an elder. Okay. Yes. I was, gonna, I was saying, who determines who's on the team versus on the committee? Excellent question. And the answer is that the pastor head of staff is responsible for organizing that team and any other team for any other responsibility the session may have delegated it to. Okay? But in many ways, the same people that were on our worship committee can be the people on that worship team doing the exact same thing. But now they report to a pastor head of staff who reports to a session. Or, I don't like the word report, but that's the accountability path, if you will. Okay. Um, So in the past, the worship committee comes from nominations from the session. Is that right? Or does it come from volunteers from the congregation? Or my experience, please correct me. My experience is in the past, we elected people elders to get them to chair a committee because the pastor couldn't get, or didn't get, and didn't choose to organize that structure. Well, the session, the committees so, were always pretty much chaired exactly. by a member of the session. Yeah, yeah there were 22 of them. Right. Exactly. So like, every one of them was, not every one of them, but a lot of them were chaired by an elder. Well, I was stewardship two years ago. I chaired stewardship. I was not an elder. Right. And so stewardship. I was asked, right about to, then. I was asked to be the chair by the committee. What committee was that? I think I can't remember. Uh, Recently, any. Uh, no, you were. It was a uh, uh, congregational engagement. Congregational engagement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's since we've done policy goes. Okay, that's, so that's a new team. Right. So in the past, though, my experience, because I, when I served on session, the pastor asked me to serve. So I can't say how anybody <laughs> else was asked to serve on a committee, but that's who asked me, would you serve on stewardship? And back then, it wasn't a standing committee. It was like a task force. You get stewardship done, and then it's over. And we stuck our mouth. Yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> It really should be continuous, right? So, um, and let me ask you this question. If I asked you to do something, or the pastor head of staff asked you to do something, which one of us are you more likely to say yes to? Be honest. It's not me here. Right. You didn't hurt my feelings. Okay. But you answered a lot of questions. Well, why would I want the pastor and the staff to organize all this structure over here when it used to be the session just did? Well, that's one answer. The main answer, though, is accountability. Okay? And to make sure we've got focus on goals, that's the session's responsibility. Right? They state the goals. Now, the pastor needs the skills to communicate that vision or that mission or those goals or those ends, they need to be able to communicate that to the organizational body that they put together, all those teams, they need to be able to explain to them why that's important to this specific church, to our specific God, right? All those structure charts you saw, what was it, the very top? Jesus, the big red box. So it's all for him, supposed to be anyway. And a pastor is probably better at communicating why we do what we do for him. Do you think? 